Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I've just had a wonderful conversation with Gregory Hyde, who is a full-time musician and worship leader, but he's starting an apologetics YouTube channel, and he's a great speaker. And uh, I just wanted to introduce my audience to him because I've really been enjoying his videos. We got to meet at the Cross-Examine Instructor Academy, but we talked about all the things today, Gregory shared his story of growing up in a Christian home and then encountering a youth pastor who couldn't really answer some of the honest questions he had about the nature of God and the existence of God and the nature of Christianity. And it actually caused him to float into a type of agnosticism. And he was brought out of that through apologetics, discovering a C.S. Lewis book. It's a great story. He shares that story with us and what led him to do the type of ministry that he does today. But we also talked through some really tough questions, some of the ones he had as a young teenager, specifically, why would God create the devil, knowing that the devil would turn against him and unleash all this evil on the world. We talked through the uh, Elisha and the Bear stories, which is a TikTok favorite among the deconstruction crowd. You know, did God just kill uh, a group of kids for making a bald joke? We talked through that. We talked about does evil prove the existence of God? And if you saw our episode with Dr. Groy Tice and Dr. Shepherdson, we talked a little bit about the moral argument. We go a little bit deeper into that in this episode. So that was a real highlight for me, but probably the biggest highlight for me was asking Gregory the question, do rock stars go to heaven when they die? Because everybody, when a rock star dies, everybody posts on social media, the music in heaven just got a whole lot better. Should we even be thinking that way? How do we process when rock stars die and do they actually go to heaven? Jam-packed episode. Can't wait for you to hear it. Here's Gregory Hyde. Well, Gregory, great to have you on the show today. We met recently at the Cross-Examined Instructor Academy, and I was so thrilled to see what the Lord has done in your life through your uh, music and through apologetics. And so for anybody who's unfamiliar with you, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, and then we're going to dig down into your story. Certainly. Uh, Well, and to you, thanks for having me on the, the program. I'm honored to be here. This is really cool. Um, and yeah, I'm a full-time musician. I've been full-time in music for the past 17 years. And recently I just started a new apologetics channel. Um, I've always been involved in, uh, in the church in in one way or another as I was growing up. Um, but, uh, I was really inspired recently to start this YouTube channel and I'll get into the details behind that later, but it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been really cool. I also lead worship at some, some different churches and organizations as well. Yeah, well, you do a great job. So the YouTube channel is at Thinking to Infinity. So if anybody wants to find Gregory's channel, go to youtube.com at Thinking to Infinity. But I'm so curious of your story, Gregory, because often when we go to a place like the cross Examine Instructor Academy, which I've talked about on the podcast a whole bunch, it's like nerd heaven for apologetics. It's like <laughs> Comic Con for apologists, you know, and it's Thank it's so her. great. We just nerd out. And it's not very often <laughs> that we, another worship leader or musician, you know, I get to connect with at one of these events. And so um, I'm really curious of your story, but let's just talk about what led you into to apologetics in the first place. Did you grow up in a Christian home? What was that like for you? Yeah, so I I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is, you know, uh, referred to as the buckle of the Bible belt. And I grew up in in church in a Christian family with parents who loved God, they loved Jesus, and and they lived it. You know, it wasn't Mm. just nominal Christianity. Uh, We were in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, every Wednesday night, and then quite a few times in addition to that. Yeah. And so we just grew up in that community and felt very loved there. You know, things were great, but from a really early age, I had a lot of big questions about it and things just didn't quite make sense to me though. I, I am an artist. I'm one of those left brained artists. So Mm. I like analytically get into like, why does this chord progression sound cool? And that one doesn't. Right. And so that was just who I was. And so I was kind of that, that pesky little kid in Sunday school who, you know, when they'd say, today, we're, we're eating part of the Red Sea. I'm like, nah, that's jello. Come on. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was kind of a problem child in Sunday school for that reason. Um, but I, I just rolled with it. You know, I loved church and I, I loved my family and I loved the, the culture we were in. But, but those questions didn't go away. And especially as I got into my teen years, those questions started getting bigger and feeling like nobody really had the answers for them. And especially when, when I was 
in my early teens, I remember going up and speaking to the youth pastor at the church I was at at the time and was mentioning some of these questions. And he replied like, well, you know, are you doing drugs? I'm like, no, I'm oh, not wow. doing drugs. He's like, well, are you sleeping around? I'm like, no, nope, don't have that problem. I was like, well, you know, are you listen to that. Like there was satanic panic right in the, the midst of that, you know, <laughs> looking at devil rock and roll. Like, no, no, I'm, you know, I'm relegated to only Carmen and Petra by my parents. Oh, so, man, um, there you go. <laughs> that's it right there. I'm good. And he was like, yeah, you're good. You're fine. Just have faith, believe, trust God. It's going to be okay. Mm. And and I know he was really well-meaning, you know. Um, it was just that I was like, well, I'm good on that stuff. But what about free will versus predestination? And what about if God made Lucifer who became Satan? Well, then evil came from love. And how can you have evil from something that's purely love? None of this makes sense. Um, and so it was really a struggle for me. And then add to that, my, my first concert I ever went to, uh, you know, after having that conversation, was uh, an Ozzy Osbourne concert. So oh. it was Ozzy Osbourne and Alice in Chains. And I was prepared for what they were telling me in youth group, which was that there were going to be satanic altar calls down front afterwards. You know, it's just going to be the, the worst level of hedonism. <laughs> and going to that and realizing, okay, well, these, these people are inebriated. But um, yeah, it's just this guy's a pop star. And this is not what was being told to me was was happening in this. So I kind of felt like I was getting lied to at church, honestly. And so it, it nudged me full on into agnosticism. And so I was still going to church. I was actually working at church you know, wow. from from the time that I graduated high school. And yet I had a lot of doubts. But I internally, I, I, I liked that culture. And I felt like if I if I let people know the depth of the questions that I have and how much this is shaking my faith, I'm not going to be welcome here anymore. And I don't want that. Mm. Um, so it was really that weird thing of I don't want to leave this community, but I also don't want to jump ship and go over there, you know, um, yeah. to, to what awaits me. So I was just in that weird middle zone. And mm. somebody, unfortunately, I don't remember who mentioned, you should read some C.S. Lewis. And uh, so I remember the day so well, so vividly, it's still in my mind. I was walking through the library because I was working as an illustrator. I'm also a left brain visual artist. Okay. And, uh, so I was looking up references for some, some, uh, some drawings that I was working on at the time. And I'm going through this aisle in the library and it just jumped out at me. The spine of this book, Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Mm. It's like, oh, yeah, somebody mentioned I should read C.S. Lewis. And so I plucked the book and just in the foreword, it was like an updated edition. And in the foreword, C.S. Lewis just took three of my biggest problems with, you know, answering wow. these questions about the faith and just, you know, did one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, just completely knocked it down without breaking a sweat. And I thought, wow, you know, there are answers to these. Yeah. I am not as intelligent as I thought I was. Other people have had these questions, too. And uh, wow. so it was such an awakening. And I just dove in after that and was amazed at what I found. And it wasn't too long before I got inspired to feel like I should start sharing this with other people who have the same questions. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you have because you have such a creative way to do it. And it makes total sense to me that you're a, a visual artist, too, because your thumbnails and everything, you know, and, and even your presentation that you gave at CIA was so uh, polished from a graphic perspective, too. Um, but so, yeah, this is such a fascinating story. It reminded me of the other day we were doing our morning devotions and we were reading through, uh, we're actually doing Skip Height 6, uh, Soaring Through the Bible, where you just kind of do an overview of each book of the Bible. So that's kind of what we're doing in our morning devotions. And it was about the Israelites and God leading them, uh, you know, in the wilderness and everything. And so it came to the part about manna. And my daughter says, oh, mom, at church. Now, this isn't the church we go to right now, so nobody from my church, I'm not dissing you guys, but a, a church we had been at before, um, she says, like, they, they told us we were eating manna, and I'm pretty sure it was a honey bun. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I mean, that's like, put that in your deconstruction starter pack, uh, kiddo, because, you know, like, 
you can just share that in your deconstruction story one day. No, I mean, I do. I tease her like that, and she, she thinks that's funny. But, I mean, yeah, stuff like that can do unintended damage. And especially, I, I think, you know, as I hear your story, it's the mixture of you having some really honest questions. And that's the thing, I think, too, that, uh, you know, if, if any youth pastors are watching or pastors, one thing that can be really helpful if somebody comes to you with questions is diagnosing, is this an honest question? Because there are people, certainly, yeah. who ask questions because they're looking for justification for a sin they want to participate in or something like that. But there are honest questions, too. And, you know, if, yeah. if it's an honest question, then there are really good answers. And I personally, Gregory, I in all the deconstruction stories I've listened to, I don't think I've ever found one deconstruction story that was purely intellectual. There was always yeah. other stuff going on. So when there's when it's just intellectual, I think that's a much easier uh, fix, especially for a youth pastor. But also uh, what really stood out to me is when you, you felt lied to because everything was portrayed as, you know, like you said, they're going to be doing satanic altar calls and there's going to be all this stuff going on. And um, mm-hmm. and that can be. And, and, and I think, too, I've even read stories of where Christians have mischaracterized evolution, saying things like, well, you know, people, monkeys aren't turning into people today, and that's not even what evolution right. teaches, right? So um, yeah. that's some that's good right. cautionary tale there. But I'm thankful that the Lord uh, led you to C.S. Lewis, and I mean, what a, what a great place to start, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, he's, it's kind of like in, in the music world when people keep talking about what a great drummer John Bonham is, and then you finally go back and listen to some Zeppelin, and you're like, oh, yeah, he really was that good. And C.S. Lewis is that for apologetics. The yeah. reason everybody quotes him all the time is because he really is that good. Or yeah, was. and sometimes I think people can be like, oh, C.S. Lewis, and maybe they haven't actually read him. But it's like, yeah, read him. It's it's really robust and formidable stuff for atheism, I think. So, Absolutely. okay, so one of the fun things we're going to do today is uh, we're going to talk through some of the questions that you had and that I can tell from your YouTube channel that as you might have had questions and thought them through, now you're turning those things into content all these years later, which is kind yeah. of great because so many people have these questions. In fact, as I'm looking through your YouTube channel right now, when I research deconstruction, so many of these are the, the well, the, the questions aren't always honest in the deconstruction movement, but these are the things like you'll, you'll have TikTok after TikTok after TikTok about, you know, God killing kids over a bald joke, right? And this is the famous mm-hmm. scene where Elisha, they say, go up baldy, and he, you know, calls the, the curse down and the bears maul the children to death. And it's just, it's like the atheist's favorite Bible story, right? Right. And right. and how do you think through that question? Like, if you think yes, about those those difficult verses in the in the Bible, especially that one, how do you think that through? Yeah, I I, I first read that one when my wife and I we were newlyweds and we decided let's read through the Bible together. And I, you know, you get to a few passages that are like, oh my goodness, this is in here. What is this? This is awful. Um, and I think it's good to ask questions about that because our our compassion really should get triggered when we're thinking, wait, you, you sent bears to kill a bunch of kids for just calling a guy bald? So I, I think there's a worthwhile question there, but we really need to dive deeply into context. That's our major, major issue with that, is when was this said or written? Why was it written? Who was it written to? What was going on in that area at the time? Were there cultural things that were significant that we could learn from? Uh, I make the point in the video that Without context, you know, uh, you might watch a movie like The Untouchables and wonder why all of these people are getting shot over beer. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back and look up historically what was happening with prohibition law, then you find out why that was happening and why Al Capone was such a bad guy. You know, he wasn't only providing, you know, uh, a cup of Schlitz malt to, you know, a couple of guys who just wanted to kick their heels back after a day, hard day at work. Right, right. so, so you really need to know the context. And so by uh, a good way to do that is look at, um, you know, theologians and historians who have uh, taken a look at these things. And what does the original Hebrew say, since that's in the Old Testament, the original language it was written in Hebrew was Hebrew. And sometimes we don't even have English words that, that concisely communicate what a particular Hebrew word said. And so you really need to look at it uh, from a few different angles. Um, So with that one in particular, a lot of people will look at the King James Version uh, of the Bible, which says that these were little children who came out and were 
mocking Elisha. But the actual word is na'ar, and it has an adjective, na'ar katan, which can mean little children. And, but if you look at where else that's used throughout the Bible, you can see that it was used to describe some guys who were in their 20s. Um, mm -hmm. It was used to describe no, uh, Moses when his mom was putting him in the basket as a, a baby child. But King Solomon even described himself as na'ar katan when he became king just because he felt like he was completely inexperienced at being a king. Mm. So sometimes it can mean somebody who is just studying to be better. They recognize I'm really a novice at this. And when we look at what was going on prior to that story, Elijah and Elisha had been battling against some pagan priests pretty regularly. Everybody knows the story of uh, Elijah having the contest with the, the pagan Baal worshipers when yeah. they you know, dug the pits around, poured water, water all over the, the sacrifice, and yet the fire from God came down. And uh, in Sunday school, we skipped the part where uh, all the pagan priests got murdered at the end of that. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But yeah, but they, they slaughtered them. And so you can only do that so many times before the only people who are left are the trainee priests who, you know, were either too young or weren't around at that particular moment. And so it seems very, uh, very likely that these were actually young men. They were pagan priest trainees who were either mocking Elisha or outright threatening him uh, mm -hmm. based upon what those words might mean. And so it wasn't just, oh, well, there was a bald joke. And so God sent these bears to kill some little kids. It was right. grown guys and they weren't just making a bald joke, but they were probably threatening Elisha, who was there by himself. And he'd been doing God's work. He, uh, you know, they had some water that was undrinkable in the area. He did a miracle, you know, God through him did a miracle mm -hmm. and purified that water. So he wasn't, uh, he wasn't just hating on those people. He was really trying to help them out. And so when you look at all of those things, it really paints a very different picture. And it's not as yeah. cut and dry as a meme with a, a toddler in the mouth of a bear. Well, I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Greg Hyde. I want to take a moment and let you know about our first sponsor for today, which is Good Ranchers. I love Good Ranchers so much. It saves me time. It saves me mental stress of trying to find good, high-quality meat for my family. And that's what it is. It's American meat delivered right to your door, shipped on dry ice, frozen, ready to go in your freezer. Or maybe you can put some in the fridge to thaw out for your dinner. I love it so much. We just grilled out some beautiful T-bone steaks the other night. I absolutely love the high quality of Good Ranchers. I love that it's owned and run by Christians who give away 10 free meals for every order that comes in through their online uh, store. So go to GoodRanchers.com, use the code ELISA, check it out, try a box, see if you like it, and that'll give you $25 off your first box. Again, that's GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ELISA for $25 off your first box. Right, exactly. And that's the thing that can be so frustrating, I think, in the realm of apologetics when we're trying to answer some legitimately difficult questions about Christianity or maybe about the yeah. nature of the Bible. But when you have somebody who can go on TikTok and dismantle the Bible in 20 or 30 seconds and nobody really cares, like that took you a few minutes and you haven't even gotten through, right. you know, there's even more to it than that. And, and, but just the context, it takes a few minutes to explain. And I just wonder too, it, it, it's like the TikTok culture, the social media culture is just, we have an uphill battle, don't we, as apologists, yeah. because somebody can just say, oh, God killed a bunch of kids. Here's the Bible verse, 20 seconds, a million likes. And right. it's just like, man. But I just yeah. hope that people will, you know, especially this younger generation, will begin to be trained to be, think to be thinking better about these things. Because I find, I don't know if you find this to be true. I know you've got kids, but sometimes kids that, that have a lot of social media influence, they almost get suspicious when you take too long to answer a question. Have you noticed that? Um, I, I have not, honestly. Uh, fortunately, we've, we've been able to uh, really police <laughs> that yes. involvement with our kids. They're, they're still pretty young at this point. Um, but, but it is something we're very concerned about, for sure. Yeah. And, and I make the point in you know, my first video that there's a problem with that when you're, you have people who are taking very complex issues and then they want to boil it down to a super concise explanation and we don't expect that with other things that are complex. And so right. when it comes to the beginning of the universe or it comes to just electricity, 
Well, you can say, yeah, we, we see the evidence for electricity, but why does electricity exist? Why does our universe work in the way that electrons and atoms move the way they do to result in electricity happening? Well, you can't give a five second TikTok answer to that. That's it's right. a very, it even gets philosophical, even among scientists of why does electricity exist? Mm. Why does it behave the way it does? So we shouldn't expect large scale questions that are very complex about human nature and human behavior, about why God asked a certain people group to do something when their culture and the entire state of the world was completely different than ours versus how we're behaving now on the other side of Christ coming. I mean, those are big issues and we shouldn't expect to just have one little soundbite right. answer for them. I mean, the Bible itself didn't do that. Jesus was pretty concise with some of his answers, but a lot of them were bigger concepts that even after he said them, he had to pull the disciples aside and say, all right, now I got to break this down for you. So I give you that's all right. the, the context behind it. Yeah, so. that's really good. Yeah, that's true. And if anybody wants a great answer to that question that we just talked about, go to Thinking to Infinity on YouTube, and it's called, <laughs> Did God Kill Kids Over a Ball Joke? El Elisha's Biblical Bear... Hang on, I'm clicking on it. Bear attack in Second Kings 2, and the thumbnail is hilarious. It's when bears of the Bible attack. <laughs> so right. that's great work there. I You, you had a, particular, um, a particularly thought-provoking video that I loved. And so I'll give some context for this, because this is something I think through a lot as a musician. I remember the day Tom Petty died, and I had this real— The almost first like, time or the second time? That, was there two times? Oh, yeah. He, he was uh, a victim of one of those hoaxes where they said he had died and they ran oh. all the things and all the oh, AP. No. And he was like, oh, we're mourning Tom Petty. And then he's like, I'm still here. Guys. I'm still here. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I must have missed yeah. that one. But that's that's terrible. Yeah. But no, the real thing when he when he really died. And I remember just becoming overwhelmed with the fear of God because I really just I love Tom Petty. I just loved all of his music. Um, I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. And w especially when they collaborated, I just loved it. And um, I just remember I was in Walgreens when I found out that Tom Petty had died. And I just remember thinking like Tom Petty is facing his eternal destination right now. Like the yeah. fear of God came over me because I don't know. I don't know where he was at, but there's such a tendency in our culture when some, some celebrity dies or something, and we always see these, um, you know, like heaven just got funkier or, you know, the music in heaven just got so much better now that, you know, Prince is there or whoever, you know, the, the latest celebrity is that, that died. Um, but how would, you, how would you handle that question? Because I'm sure a lot of young people are like, they look up to these rock stars and they think, oh, this person died. Surely God wouldn't send Prince to hell. You know, how do, right. how do we think through that? You're a musician. How do yeah. you think through that? Yeah, well, again, I think, you know, we need to look at the reason why people are saying what they're saying or reposting what they're posting. And I think it starts from a good place. It starts from a, a place of feeling like we were moved by these artists in such a profound way. We want what's best for them. We don't want to imagine that Prince is not going to heaven. You know, that would be horrible. Yeah. And um, honestly, it feels like a friend died when you have this connection with somebody who's art and their music has moved you to such a great degree. But it, it's it's really easy and really quick to, when you see the meme pop up, just go, yep, I'm gonna share that. And so the music in heaven just got a lot better today. And I feel good about that, you know? I, I feel mm -hmm. like I, I put some more positivity out there into the universe. <laughs> um, but the problem is that contradicts, if, if we're saying we're Christians and we submit our lives to the teachings of Christ. Well, he is the way, the truth, the life. He is the only way to get to God the Father. And so if we really believe that, then we can't know. We really can't. And making a presumption about where somebody wound up is, you know, not really helpful because it's sharing that message to other people who might be looking at us share that meme, knowing we're Christians and thinking, oh, well, they, they don't actually think that it relies on faith in Christ. Um, and, and the really scary thing about it is that it really implies that getting to heaven is accomplished by a popularity contest. It's yeah. by, I achieved this great thing. I have masses of fans who follow me and adore me. So therefore I get to go to heaven. And that's, that's pretty concerning. Um, I think we really need to stop and ask, are the things that I'm saying online or the things that I'm sharing, are those consistent 
with what I truly believe and what I say about salvation, what I say about my faith. And so it's, uh, I try to make the point in that video that it's not really helpful to speculate on where other people went, especially when like Prince was a Jehovah's Witness who yeah. they don't believe you go to heaven when you die. Yeah. Um, so everybody was like, Prince is in heaven. I'm like, he would disagree with you. He, yeah, he right, right. <laughs> um, so there's there's that concern, but but also just what are we communicating when we share those things? And we really want to make sure that we're, we're con, uh, consistent and sharing the truth that Christ preached and not what's culturally popular or what might feel good by hitting retweet. Right. And that's so tempting sometimes, too. Like you said, it just feels like it's the positive and good vibes thing to do is to to hit like and share and something like that. But it's interesting yeah. as I think about even the nature of heaven. And w I, when I think about this question, I think, what do they think heaven actually is? Because if you think about, and I'm not, you know, saying anybody specific, I don't know, but let's yeah. say there's a rock star who just does not like the ways of God here on earth. They mm -hmm. they don't want to live God's way. They hate God's rule and reign. They hate his word. They hate what he says we should, what we are as humans and how we should live. Why do we think that they would want to spend eternity where all of that is just magnified by a hundred? I think yeah. it might have been C.S. Lewis who said even the blades of grass would feel like razor blades to people who hate God in this life. And it's just going to be a more yeah. concentrated version of that in heaven. And I think that maybe in our culture, we just don't think that through, though, because we buy the idea that heaven is sort of this eternal party of hedonistic pleasures. And everybody, of course, would want to go there. But we fail to realize sometimes, I think, even as we communicate this as Christians, that heaven is like, we're going to be face to face with God's glory. And right now we see through a glass darkly, but it's going to be revealed. And if you don't like that now, you're probably, that would be like hell for somebody totally. who hates yeah. God in this life. I agree completely. I, I feel like if, if your heart is completely opposed to the God who created this universe, your options really are hell or hell. Mm. So, oh, wow. Um, yeah. That's interesting. That's really good. Well, let's talk about some of these other, what would you say when you were younger and you had those questions that you went to your youth pastor with, what do you think was probably the most nagging one, the biggest one for you? All right, time to tell you about our next sponsor for today, which is Carly Jean Los Angeles, a Los Angeles-based clothing line started by Carly Brandon. She's a mom. She's a wife. She is pro-life. She's a Christian. I absolutely love this company. I love the clothes. Not only are they high quality and so cute, I wear their jeans and their basics line just about every single day, and I'm always getting compliments, but I love that they have a rewards program. So if you download their little app here, you can sign up. And for every dollar you spend, you get points, and then you can redeem those points for discounts. They're always running great promos and coming out with new clothes. And if you order over $100, the shipping is free. So try it out. See what you think. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. You can use my code, ALISA, for 20% off your first order. That's uh, CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use my code, ALISA, for 20% off your first order. I think the biggest one was the, if God is perfect love and he made Lucifer mm. and, and he knew that was coming, you know, yeah. he knew that was going to happen. Um, then he intentionally created evil. And so that hung me up for quite a while. And one of the things that was mentioned in the foreword of that book was that it's, it's a category error, right? Mm. It's looking at something in an incorrect way. So if you consider evil to be a substance or an actual thing, then that's where that mistake can happen. Whereas evil is the lack of goodness in the same way that darkness is the lack of light. So light is measurable. It's something that is very clear. It exists. Whereas darkness is simply you remove all the light. All you're left with is darkness. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way, God, who is pure love, pure light, goodness, if he's able to make a creature who can decide to rebel against him and leave him, where else can you go? If you're going out of the light, you're just heading into darkness. So it's not so much that that is a substance or something that exists, some state of matter or anything like that. It's just not godness. 
And mm. so Satan moved full on into not godness and God allowed him to go there. Yeah. So um, it really opens your eyes quite a bit, um, which my incorrect thinking on evil being something, um, being a thing, mm -hmm. really led me to the incorrect belief as well that God, love, light, goodness, was the opposite of evil, bad, darkness. And so these things are completely opposed, and there's sort of like this yin-yang situation. Yeah, yeah. It takes you to more of a Taoist thought. And, you know, C.S. Lewis pointed out in that forward yet again, that even if it wasn't Jesus versus the devil, if it was just Michael, the angel versus the devil, we see in Revelation how Michael actually is going to defeat him. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. even if it was just angels against the devil, that's all he is. So there is no even there's just as much evil as there is good. It's, yeah. it's not all positive energy versus negative energy. It, that just doesn't play out. Yeah. And, which is good for us. I mean, thank God in heaven for that. That yes. uh, this is this is not a tough battle for him. Yeah. No, I'm so glad you brought this up because I think this is something that a lot of Christians might have misconceptions about. I know I probably certainly did growing up where you do almost see it like, and maybe even in some of our songs where you you have this sort of clash of good versus evil where, oh gosh, you just cross your fingers and hope God wins in the end. I mean, I know it's prophesied, right. but we'll see what happens. But yeah, I, I think you're right. Those two things are really tied together. I've even heard it uh, described as it's like rust on a car. Rust doesn't, ex you, you don't have rust unless you have the car that it grows on or the metal or whatever the, the property is that rust grows on, it can't grow mm -hmm. by itself. And so um, in apologetics, we talk about evil being a privation of good, where just as you've described, it's it's God didn't create evil. He created the potential for evil by giving humans and angels the will to be able to reject him and turn away from him, which, as you just said, there's just one way to go. And that's not God. That's not good, which is going to be bottoming out in evil. And I think that 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 really, for me, too, solved a lot of uh, issues when I was thinking through my faith from a more critical thinking perspective as an adult. And I, I think it was Augustine possibly who worked this out where, you know, he worked out the idea that evil is a privation of good because then God's not the author of evil. He's not the creator of evil, but yet he gave us free will. And for love to even be possible, you have to have the opportunity to either accept or reject or else we're just robots that are programmed to behave a certain way. But as we all know, that's not real love. So I, I right. love that. That's crazy that it was just the forward that answered those oh, yeah. two big questions yeah. for you. So what was the rest of the book like for you? Oh, well, well, it was surprising because I didn't realize the rest of the book is really, you know, technically a fictional account. Um, it's it's an allegory, really, of, mm -hmm. of C.S. Lewis portraying uh, an elder mentor demon talking to, I think, his nephew, um, Screwtape. Yeah, Screwtape, um, yeah. Telling him, here's how you should conquer this guy's soul who is... You know, during the, the time of World War II, he's considering his mortality. He's considering all these things about the, the church he grew up in. And he's having all these questions. Well, here's how to plant these little seeds of doubt in his mind to get him to move away from the faith so that we can claim his soul at the end of his life. And it's it's fascinating. It, you know, the first time I read it, I was expecting more like the foreword where it was just straight truth bombs on yeah. here's the apologetics knowledge you, you, that you need. Um, but it was... It was such a, a surprise, but it was really great. And and that led me on to reading his other works um, on the Four Loves and Letters to Malcolm. Oh, my goodness. That that book is great. And it's not usually uh, put in the list like Weight of Glory. Yeah, I haven't books. read that one. I'm going to have to read that one. Yeah, it's, letters to Malcolm. it's all his letters to a friend. You don't get the, the, the responding correspondence. Um, that's kind of an oxymoron anyway yeah <laughs> um you don't get the other side of the uh, the letters but it's still fascinating he has a lot on prayer that is really thought-provoking great stuff and of course mere christianity i always tell everybody yeah if you're if you've just become a christian welcome to the faith get a good bible get mere christianity and get there tactics you and you're there set. you go <laughs> that's a shout out to our friend greg kokel and tactics yeah. which 
I've read t personally twice. And I, I use those tactics. The few times I've had public discussions with progressive Christians, I've used them kind of on my own way. I don't ask them just a, the questions just as Greg says to ask them, but I use those tactics and it's so helpful. So definitely yep. everybody listening, you know, Greg's been on a bunch of times, but definitely pick up yep. tactics if you don't have it already. All right. What what do you think would be your your second most nagging question that you brought out as a as a young guy that led you into agnosticism? Um, the second one would would be like, why doesn't God just snap his fingers and like the test is over? Whoever was mm. going to choose me, you guys go to heaven. Whoever wasn't, you know, you're you're just out of the picture now. So you're um, talking so about like, like if if he's predestining salvation, why doesn't he just and do it now? Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. Oh, so how how do you think that was, went through? It was it was a little bit of the the moral argument that that atheists will propose as well. Of you know, well, if your God's all good, then he would stop evil, and if he was all powerful, you know, he would do it. So he's obviously not either one of those, or not one of them. Um, so it was it was really difficult, and the way I got through that one was really kind of an amalgam of C.S. Lewis and Greg Kokel and Frank Turek and you know other people that that were. Uh, that I was studying and thinking a lot of these questions were really coming at them from a uh, a position of, you know, naturally, how a human being would think about it. We're, we're thinking about it from our perspective and we're not thinking about it from his. Mm -hmm. And given that can get really difficult because we have finite human minds and his ways are above our ways. He's so much more beyond us uh, to think that our minds can you know, hang on the exact same level as the being who created the entire known universe just because he could and he wanted to. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty arrogant to think like, oh, I can understand whatever he can throw at me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so there's that. But but really thinking of from his perspective about the things that we know that he's revealed to us about himself was that we know he thought it was good to make this universe, to make us. And we have his word on that that he thought it was good. It was a good, so I don't really get into all of the reasons behind that, but ultimately if he wanted beings to be with him forever, because he is love, he wants this perfect loving relationship with more beings to experience all of this goodness and wonderfulness and love. Well, he doesn't want robots. He doesn't want, you know, cause he could just, all right, everybody, you do exactly what I say. And um, he, he didn't want that. And so to give us the opportunity to choose him or not choose him requires some level of free will. In my series, I, I give an example at one point talking about free will versus predestination and saying, if you had the ability to make AI robots, so they're completely autonomous, they have control over their own decisions and their own actions, just like we do in the exact same way. And you create all of them, but your desire is to clean up the environment. So you're making these AI robots to clean up all the bad stuff in the environment, and plant trees and make things better. And you know, because you have access to all of the, the data throughout their, their thought processes, you know some of them are going to choose to help you. And some of them are going to choose to fight against you. And they're actually gonna become litter bots and make things even worse, even though you've asked them, don't do that. Well, you know it up front, but if you do this, there are the ones who are going to help you are going to win eventually with your help. And so you decide to make them anyway. And so the ones who help you, they do help you. And then you reward them somehow. <laughs> and then, uh, I don't know what an AI robot but really I, you want, know, like but, a, you know, you're able to figure it out. Metal yeah. cookie or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A metal, metal. A little yeah. oil so, in the joints, maybe. Right, right. <laughs> well, then the ones who go against you, you have them melted down for scrap. Okay. So at the end of that experiment, well, who is really responsible for cleaning up the environment? You are because you made them and you had the choice to not make them because you knew what the outcome would be. And who is responsible for all those litter bots getting burned up and turned into scrap? Again, you, because you made them and you knew what they were going to do and you knew what their end was going to be. So you have complete and total sovereignty over this situation. But who made the decisions to do what they did? They they did. So they deserve either the reward <laughs> or yeah. the punishment coming their way because they made that decision of their own free choice. So with that, 
I don't see any other way how God could wind up with all the people who choose to love him for eternity unless he kind of does this huge experiment that we're going through right now yeah. uh, in this world that he's made. And it's, it's really, I think, kind of beautiful when we think about how God knew what we were going to do. He knew the, the bad decisions we were going to make. He knew that we were, all of us, going to, at some point in our lives, choose to walk away from him. We were going to choose the bad decisions. We were going to choose the sinful thing to do. And yet he said, the way this ends up is worth it. The mm -hmm. end result is, is worth making you because yeah. I so want you guys to be loved and fulfilled. It's, it's worth the broken eggs to make this omelet. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's, it's pretty incredible that all of those, all of us who wind up with him forever are going to have a knowledge of, we know what the other option was. We had a full yeah. drink from not this. So I'm never leaving this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, when I when I think through, of course, the <clears throat> the free will predestination question is one that Christians have pondered for thousands of years. In fact, recently, we put out a video on an intro to classical apologetics with Dr. Doug Groyteis and Dr. Andrew Shepherdson. And it was interesting because even among the two of them, uh, Ike offers the free will defense, kind of similar to what you've just described. And Doug is more mm -hmm. on the reformed side, so he doesn't offer the re the free will defense. And so Christians kind of, you know, debate o over these things. And it's the, the most difficult thing to think through. But I, I think that's a very helpful example you've given. Did you think of that robot example yourself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to run by that theory. by some philosophers <laughs> and see what they think about that because that makes a whole lot of sense to me. You know, of course, keeping the in in view that God is sovereign over the whole thing yeah. and basing Absolutely. His creation on His foreknowledge, which would be more of the non reformed view, which I am. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's that's fairly interesting. It's a it's a tough one, isn't it? Because it affects like what yeah. you think about predestination, free will is going to affect how you pray. It's going to affect um, what role right. you think God is playing in your prayers and what role you play in your prayers. And so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good one to think through. Um, yeah, how do you, definitely be, oh, sorry. No, no, please. Uh, there, there can definitely be portions of those debates that, that stump us and make us feel like, well, then that doesn't quite explain this. It's not that everything in the Bible has a completely, you know, cut and dry Clear, answer to yeah. it. Yeah. But I do, I do feel like a lot of times when we reach those portions of the Bible that it seems like well, you either need to choose this side or this side. To me, quite a few times, there's something that kind of dovetails those two views. Yeah. And so with this one, I, I, for me, it makes the most sense of, well, that still establishes the elect, which you really yep. can't get around if you're reading right. the New Testament. That's no. right. The, the chosen of God. Okay, so God sovereignly has chosen the people who will be saved, who will be with him forever but you're also judged on your own deeds. It's not like, well, God chose me to do all these bad things, so why am I facing eternal torment? Because he made me do all this stuff. Yeah. Um, it, you know, and, and to your point as well, why should I evangelize? Why should I speak to anybody or pray for the salvation of anybody if God already chose them and they're gonna be saved no matter what I do? So you, you get into these really difficult conundrums. And so I, I think it's, it's a good thing to, yeah. to try to reconcile those things within the Bible to see how can we find a way to, to make both of these viewpoints yeah. make sense. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm a Calvinist on Tuesday and Wednesdays and then like Thursday through Monday. <laughs> I'm non-reformed. I, I don't think I'll figure it out in this lifetime. But, you know, speaking of evil and free will and all this, do you think that a case could even be made that evil proves the existence of God? Absolutely. Absolutely. Talk about that. Okay, so, uh, you know, we, we know the, uh, which on, on my, my program, I really try to take these larger apologetics concepts and maybe take off the philosophical terminology and just get to the root of what the issue is about. We were mentioning earlier how, uh, though I loved apologetics early on, I, I felt like, you know, unless you're wearing a bow tie most days of the week, and if you've not spoken Latin in the past 36 or hours. smoked a pipe. You're, you're, Sm smoking yeah, a pipe. Right. And, yeah. Your apologetic card is revoked. <laughs> um, so when was the last time you said apropos? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> a priori. Well, right, right. Yeah, I, I even, uh, one of my little 
in video memes is uh, me stumbling over trying to say a priori, but because uh, <laughs> uh, most people yeah, a priori. A priori yeah, I, I probably say it wrong. I probably say everything wrong. <laughs> I learned yeah. mostly from and, reading books, so I, I've learned over the years that I pronounce things wrong because I'm not yeah. hearing it. So, Oh, that's half the fun of having homeschool kids is yeah. correcting <laughs> the hilarious pronunciations these kids get because the only expo uh, exposure to certain words they've had so far is when they've read them. That's great. What was the question? Does evil <laughs> prove God? Can we prove God yeah. because of evil? Right, right. So when we, we see good, we see evil, we see good, we see bad. Obviously, everybody looks around our world, no matter what your worldview is, and can say things are not as they should be. And that's the claim everybody's making. We all have different moral claims about the world, but ultimately, we all just sense that these horrible, awful things happen. And a lot of times, just like that, um, uh, the, the, uh, the issue people bring up with God about, you know, how could, how could this thing happen or how could a good God allow this you know, they're really pointing to that that issue of evil exists. And like I mentioned earlier, either your God's not powerful enough to stop it or he's not totally good because he's allowing it or he even made it. And that's obviously a difficult question to ask. But if we think about it, the only reason evil could exist is if good exists and these things are opposed to each other. So you either go yin yang and this is, you know, a perfect balance of good and evil or um but but that actually doesn't that still doesn't answer the question of where is it coming from because in a completely material universe uh if secular humanism is right we should just be used to it by now mm -hmm. it should just be that's the way things are it just happens that way um there's a quote that i mentioned in a recent video from john steinbeck when he wrote in the grapes of wrath there's no sin, there ain't no sin and there ain't no virtue there's just stuff people do mm. but nobody agrees with that right like we don't live our lives based on that and so it makes sense that if we have all these inner moral knowings of like murder is wrong murder is absolutely wrong rape is wrong no matter when it happens no matter where it happens no matter who's doing it mm -hmm. that's wrong so we all know that objective morality exists but based on what because when we look at evolution well if if the goal is just to get our DNA into the next generation, then that's just fine. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's actually right. good. Yeah, we're, we're survival of the fittest. Existence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so murder can be good if it means me and my family get more resources. Uh, I don't actually think that, so I don't right. want that to turn into a sound bite anywhere. But um, right. so, so when we look at evolution, well, it goes that way. But then if you say, okay, well, society and culture, well, there are multiple societies and cultures who think that, Rape can be okay in some certain circumstances. Murder can be okay in certain circumstances, but we don't feel right about that. And even people who come from those backgrounds, um, if, if you're familiar with Jim Elliott, uh, he was yeah. a missionary who went to minister to an unreached people group in Ecuador and he was murdered by them. And his wife, it's a miraculous, amazing story. If you're not familiar yeah. with it, I highly recommend you check that out. Um, I think, uh, Gosh, is it under the banner of heaven? Um, something of that, that uh, nature? Well, there's, there's End of the Spear, which I think is, I can't remember. So Elizabeth Elliot wrote Through the Gates of Splendor, I yeah, think. There we which, go. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it, it tells that story. And um, there's a documentary now that you can watch with the actual tribesmen talking about what had happened and their awareness that, so unreached people group, they had no outside influence on morality and they were murdering people <laughs> regularly. Mm -hmm. And then they, but they knew this was wrong. They knew they were wrong. And it was only when uh, Mrs. Elliot came and was ministering to them that they realized, yeah, we, we need Jesus because we are wrong, sinful people. We murder is objectively wrong, even though that was almost like societally, uh, a societal normality. For them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we all know that. So we have to look at where is this inner knowledge coming from? And I think when we look at it, a theistic God is the only way we can have that. We have to have this rule giver if we all know this rule exists, right? Yeah. So uh, Eric Kopel makes a great <laughs> analogy about how uh, you can't speed on certain parts of the Audubon because there's no 
speed limit there. There's no rule. Yeah. So you're not breaking any rule. But by saying murder is wrong, rape is wrong, child abuse is wrong, we're saying these rules exist. Well, where did they come from? Who made them? And every time we look at well, evolution, society, culture, our, our you know, evolutionary programming, it always comes up wanting, if not supporting the opposite view that yeah. we all know is right. It's, yeah. it's only with God that that makes sense. So in, in that way, I do believe evil is proof that God exists. Yeah. You know, I know when I was going, God. yeah, yeah. When I was going through my faith crisis, um, that was honestly what I, I hadn't discovered any apologetics yet, but that was one of the things that I knew. I, I knew evil existed. I'd experienced it. I knew it had. And I thought if evil exists, there has to be something we're measuring that by to know that that's wrong. Otherwise, it would just be normal. It wouldn't be wrong. And so right. that was just a huge part of my journey as well as thinking that through even before I had heard any formal arguments, you know, for that for that case. Well, this has been fascinating. I we're about out of time here, but I want to have you tell everybody again where they can connect with you online, uh, where they can. I don't know if you've got a website or, or what's going on, but anything else you want to say and then where people can connect with you. Sure, sure. Um, so you can find me on YouTube at thinking to infinity and i do have a website that's still under construction you can go there if you'd like to reach out to me about uh speaking speaking engagements or uh, anything along those lines you can go to thinking to infinity.com and reach out to me there i'm on uh, most of the socials as thinking to infinity as well and yeah yeah that's where All i right. am very good. Well, I want to thank my guest, Gregory Hyde, for joining on the podcast today. What a great discussion. And I've heard Gregory present apologetics. He's a great speaker. So if you're looking for a great, solid apologist to bring to your church, he's a great uh, person to reach out to. And don't forget, you can go to alisachilders.com slash music to pre-order my new music that's coming out on October 24th. You can also visit Instagram and Facebook at Elisa Childers Music and YouTube.com at Elisa Childers Music. I also want to thank Southern Evangelist Evangelical Seminary for being one of our sponsors today. I love my classes at SES. You can go to ses.edu slash Elisa, download a free ebook there, and find out all the wonderful uh, opportunities that SES has to offer. And as always, let's remember as we pursue Christ to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time. <laughs>